Hi guys, I am Dr. Anand Suresh and hope you all are aware that we are shifting to online classes. So it's good to meet you guys in uh, online class. Okay, today's topic is about indirect tooth color restoration. So the topic learning outcomes is direct and indirect restoration definition and uh, in lane only preparation definitions and indications and contraindications of direct and indirect restorations as well as advantages and disadvantages and uh, i'm going to talk about a little bit about cat cam and uh, summarize the clinical procedures which is more important and uh, the last one is describe briefly the clinical procedures impression making and provisional restorations for indirect tooth color restorations when we talk about indirect tooth color restorations you should know about that is what is direct and indirect restorations okay direct restoration is simple as such is the technique which involves placing a soft or malleable filling into the prepared tooth and building up the tooth before the material sets hard okay basically this uh, a typical example of direct restoration is what we do as a composite restorations okay composite restorations or a GIC or an amalgam which which you directly take the material, place it in the patient's mouth and then you cure it and the material sets inside the patient's mouth. So that we call it as a direct restoration. So when we talk about indirect restorations, it is defined as restorations that are fabricated outside of the mouth. And most indirect restorations are made on a replica of the prepared tooth in a dental laboratory by a trained technician. Okay, this means you are going to take an impression of your preparation. For example, you prepare, there is a decay in your tooth. You prepare a cavity and then you are not going to do a direct restoration example composite. You are not going to do that. But instead, you want to do that in an indirect restoration like a ceramic or a cast metal or something like that. So what you will do after preparation, you, you, are, you are going to take an impression of the cavity preparation and then you have to send that to the dental laboratory. And in that dental laboratory, they are going to make a restoration or a crown or anything and then they are going to send it back. So with that indirect restoration, you are going to loot it back. So the full the full lecture series involves about how to do a preparation of inlay only and how we are going to take an impression and how we are going to send that to the lab and how we are going to loot it. Loot that. So we go to the next slide. Okay. And uh, we talk about inlay and onlay a bit. So inlay is nothing but involves the occlusal and proximal surfaces of posterior tooth and may cap one or more but not all of the cusps. It means if the cavity is white, if the cavity is white, okay, okay, later in, in the slides I will be discussing about how to choose between a class 2 restoration and an inlay restoration. Okay, so I will be talking about uh, the differences between class 2 amalgam restoration and class 2 inlay restoration. So I will be explaining a lot about preparation, uh, what will be the bevel and everything. So, so we move on to the next onlay. So onlay is a type of restoration that involves the proximal surface of a posterior tooth and it, and all of the cusps. Inlay is, it, cap, it caps one or more cusps but not all cusps but whereas onlay it, it, it caps all the cusps next okay now the indication of uh, your indirect tooth colored restoration okay indications will be high aesthetic demands definitely when there is a restoration when a patient comes to your clinic with a fractured upper central incisor and then the patient uh, wants a tooth colored restoration okay so we call it that as an aesthetic demand okay you cannot give a uh, full metal crown on an anterior teeth so that spoils the aesthetics so indirect tooth color restorations is very very the indication will be the main thing will be high aesthetic demand so next is the replace moderate to large existing restorations yes if in case the restoration is uh, big and keep on chipping and keep on there are a lot of cases coming to a clinic uh, saying uh, you have done a restoration that is a composite restoration on a posterior teeth and the patient often comes to you complaints of fracture on the same same uh, restoration so that means there is the occlusal load for the direct composite restorations more so 
so the indication will be to go to indi uh, indirect illustrations so that's what they meant as replace moderate to large excess illustration and next is your fracture tooth or restoration the same thing again and patients with good oral hygiene yes so for all the restorations so this is an important point so we move on to the next when there is no excessive attrition yes this i will be discussing later okay and uh, where access and isolation are easy yes because when you when you're going to do uh, indirect restoration and you're going to loot it so definitely you need to have a saliva free environment or a moisture contamination should be less so this this applies to all restoration but especially for indirect tooth restoration you have to focus this more your isolation is very very important and next is when there is no excessive undercuts in the preparation yes there is there should not be any undercuts in the preparation you have to prepare your cavity preparation in such a way that there are, there, there are no undercuts okay okay next we move on to contraindications contraindications is something like you should not advise your indirect restoration in these cases like parafunctional habits like clenching bruxism excessive wear and uh, patients with poor oral hygiene yes definitely and when there is inadequate enamel left for bonding okay usually for any bonding mechanism and uh, we usually advise uh, for enamel support in the sense the bonding to enamel is very very important let's say whether it's a direct or an indirect restoration when you do a composite restoration we usually when you do a composite direct restoration we usually advise to preserve the enamel okay when you do a class 4 we ask you to give a bevel on the enamel surface when i was giving a demo in the clinics i used to always insist on giving a bevel on the labial surface of your uh, tooth surface that, that is enamel so why is that important means your bonding your composite bonding to enamel is more than your composite bonding to dentin okay so we always need adequate enamel for bonding for all direct and indirect restorations and next is when there are marked undercuts in the cavity preparation okay what will happen if there are undercuts okay first what is what is undercuts actually so when you prepare a cavity preparation your cavity walls or your your floor should be smooth okay so if it is not smooth if there are ups and downs it is called as undercuts so undercuts is okay to some extent in your direct restorations so when it comes to your indirect restorations if you prepare a cavity if there are undercuts sometimes when i prepare uh, indirect tooth colored restorations the it depends on the caries extent if the there is a particular spot where the dk will be more in a, in a, in a cavity so i i have to use a round bar and, and remove it so now that cavity is indicated for indirect tooth color restoration so what what i'm going to do it's contraindicated that it says undercut is contraindicated so what i can do is if in case there are undercuts in your cavity preparation for indirect tooth color restoration so what you can only the undercuts you can place a gic cement and then make it as a flat surface so that you block the undercut so it's called blocking of the undercuts and then you can take the impressions into the lab so we'll be discussing about that in later stages and next is your crowded or mal aligned teeth okay crowded or mal aligned teeth definitely your indirect restoration is contraindicated uh, teeth with inadequate enamel as we mentioned enamel is an important factor for bonding so next is non ideal occlusion and then teeth weakened by existing large restoration so we move on to the next one okay if in case i want to just uh, tell this in case you have any doubts in the slides which i am explaining which you cannot catch up or uh, you can always have a discussion forum in the e portal so that you just let me know whether i am i'm going very fast or you want me to slow down and explain more of sim in simple terms so so it will be easy for me to improve in my next stages and slides as well okay next is advantages so advantages is it is highly aesthetic definitely indirect tooth color restoration is highly aesthetic an acceptable marginal fit yes the fit is good when compared to your direct restorations then less occlusal wear yes low thermal conductivity low coefficient of thermal expansion biocompatibility okay next is disadvantage 
high cost yes because you're going to take impression you're going to send it to the lab the lab cost and then the looting charges is definitely high so according to that you you have to charge the patient some are affordable some are not so that's why they say it's high cost and next is need for special and laboratory equipment yes for example uh, or nowadays all ceramic like uh, full ceramic crowns or full ceramic veneers and full ceramic uh, inlays they need a cat cam technology okay now they, we are shifting more towards digital dentistry where you need all those expensive equipments for a better quality so it's it's i wouldn't say it's a disadvantage you you have to be prepared when you're giving when you are going to give an impression to the lab you need to find out whether they have this equipments and next is fabrication and cementation processes are highly technique sensitive yes moisture contamination should not be there and cementation throughout the procedure there should not be any moisture contamination so it is called highly technique sensitive okay next is ceramic inlays are brittle and can fracture during trying and cementation yes there is a chance the increased hardness of ceramics can wear the opposing tooth okay this is what i told i will be discussing about that when i was discussing the previous slide where sometimes when you give a zirconia okay when you talk about all ceramic crowns the all ceramics is divided into different types let's say anterior your ceramic is called lithium disilicate material okay so when you go to the posterior it is called zirconia okay so anterior lithium disilicate usually we prefer and for anterior teeth we prefer lithium disilicate ceramics okay so the main advantage is it does not have more strength when compared to zirconia which you give in the posteriors whereas it is very translucent okay if a material is very translucent it allows the light to pass by so when you give that type of material in your anterior tooth it it almost mimics your natural tooth by allowing the light to pass on so it mimics your natural enamel tooth so that's why we prefer to give lithium disilicate so so at this stage i want you to know about the types of ceramic okay types of ceramics are lots that is lithium disilicate glass particles and then in posteriors you give us zirconia ceramics okay when they talk about increased hardness of ceramics can wear the opposing tooth so what does that mean if when you give a zirconia crown on your posterior uh, tooth so what will happen the zirconia is the they, they call it as strength okay mpa they, it, it is measured in mpa so they call it when the patient bites on the zirconia for example 36 is a zirconia crown and uh, okay 1 2 3 6 is zirconia crown and opposing to the 2 6 is normal crown let's imagine that so when the patient bites or when the patient has an a night grating habit or a bruxism when the patient bites that so what will happen there is a constant rubbing of your normal enamel surface in 2 6 with that of your ceramics so what will happen it keep on rubbing and then it causes attrition of your normal tooth your ceramics is very hard sometimes it will cause your, your zirconia crown will cause attrition in your bruising tooth so it is very wise and is very important to know about the knowledge of ceramics before you give you give that to the patient okay you have to choose your ceramic uh, types wisely okay before going into uh, inlay and onlay preparations i want to just give a brief outline about uh, the difference between class 2 silver amalgam and your class 2 inlay okay so this is the basic thing you need to know i feel before we proceed so the outline form for the normal silver amalgam it will be narrow and the walls converge occlusally why it converges occlusally because your amalgam does not have your your uh, bonding that it does not bond actually so what will happen it, it your wall should be occlusally convergent so that it, it has a mechanical retention okay, the main uh, retention for amalgams is your mechanical retention so that's why you give a occlusal convergence whereas in your class 2 inlay your wall should be divergent okay if you give for example for a class 2 inlay you give uh, occlusal convergence same like amalgam okay so you cannot fit your inlay in, inside the cavity if you give walls convergence if you give a divergence occlusally so then only you can fix your class 2 indirect restoration okay okay next the cap we talk about cavity depth cavity width sorry 
cavity width is the one fourth of the intercuspal distance as we all know whereas for inlay it is one third it means your cavity size is more your cavity width is more when compared to your solar amalgam and next is your cavo surface angle cavo surface angle is nothing but your your um, joining surface of your internal and external walls of your cavity preparation so for silver amalgam it is 90 degree whereas your class 2 inlay is 130 to 140 lap sliding fit joint and gingival bevel we usually don't give for silver amalgam but if it is given it is 15 to 20 for class 2 it is 20 to 30 silver amalgam you can give it for it's very rare actually so undercuts it improves retention in undercuts whereas in silver amalgam whereas in your class 2 inlay that should not be undercuts since I, I explained previously that if there is undercuts you need to block with your base cements like uh, GAC or, or anything composite or anything make it flat and then you should proceed and then the minimum clearance the minimum clearance is the distance between your prepared tooth and your next to normal tooth so the minimum clearance is 0.5 mm from the adjacent tooth Whereas your class 2 inlay is more clearance needed because you're going to the, the thickness of the metal or your indirect ceramic material will be more. So you need you need more clearance. And more clearance in they say they say maximum. Maximum can be to 1 mm. And next is your secondary retention, groove slot spins, yes, silver amalgam, you can. But here, yeah, here also you can use groove slots internal boxes. And internal line angle is rounded in silver amalgam, whereas it's class 2 inlay, it is well defined. It cannot be rounded. Uh, proximal walls provided with primary flares, whereas uh, inlay, onlay, it has got primary and secondary flares. Reverse curve, usually we give for silver amalgam restoration, whereas for onlay, not necessary. So, with that, we move on to the next stage CAD cam technology yes okay first let me explain what is CAD and CAM CAD means computer aided design and CAM means computer aided manufacturing it is a technology concerned with the use of digital computers to perform certain functions in design and manufacturing before CAD CAM was used for the different purposes and now dentistry has adapted before some some years so this this is making our job easier okay so how do how does this work okay CAD is computer aided design for example you take an impression and then okay there are the recent technology they say the recent advances they say no need to use an impression material like uh, we call it as a putty material okay hydrochloids or anything no need to use that you can just have a digital impression where where you have a digital uh, machine and then you just have to scan your two preparation so that from your digital impression it, it directly goes to your computer okay so in that computer you can actually uh, increase the crown size let's say when you're going to give a new crown you can you can adjust the weight you can adjust the thickness and everything so that's called computer aided design so okay, you can be able to make the design in your computer and then computer aided manufacturing from the system if you're okay if you have created the design and you have created the width and everything and from that you have to connect to a machine where your cat cam machine can make your crowns so that is called as computer aided manufacturing so we take an impression digital impression in your mouth or the patient's mouth and then through that it goes to your computer so that you can you can edit or do anything adjust and then from the computer you have to send it to the CAD hardware it's called computer manufacturing so this is this is a rough idea about CAD CAM and all ceramic crowns has to be done in CAD CAM technology okay next we move on to the clinical procedures where uh, I feel this is very important for you guys so clinical procedures is what is since I have explained before it's like tooth preparation Okay, now we don't, we no more call that as a cavity preparation. So we call it as a tooth preparation since I think you are all aware. And next we, after the tooth preparation, it may be an either inlay or an onlay or a veneer or a full ceramic crown or a full crown anything. So it's called a tooth preparation. So after that, you have to take an impression. Okay, impression and as of now, we don't have the digital scanners since uh, now we have uh, alginate impression or a putty impression with the light body you can take it 
Next, after you take the impression, you will need to give a temporary registration. And then you have to send that impression to the lab. So the lab will make your uh, permanent crown or a permanent restoration. Okay, before you you make a permanent restoration, you can always do a train and cementation. Okay, train is nothing but before the final all ceramic crown has been done, you can just you can just take the crown, the train crown, and then fit and check the high points and the clearance and everything. If you want, you can go ahead with cementation. Or you can just send it back and then use the temporary provisional crowns and then after that you send it to the lab the train crowns and then they will polish and everything and then they can give it back so that you can fix it permanently and tooth preparation okay as a first clinical step the patient should be anesthetized and the area isolated with rubber tap usually for if in case a patient has a severe sensitivity if the decay is deep we usually advise to give anesthesia or we can proceed with a normal cavity preparation and isolation with rubber time is important next is the compromised restoration at this point complete remote it means that if there is an old restoration sometimes what we think in mind if the restoration from outside is it will look good okay when you take an x-ray and the old restoration underneath the old restoration there will be a secondary decay which which will go unnoticed so it is always better completely to remove the old restoration before you proceed as any restoration or all ceramic restorations okay it is very important to remove the old restoration and then the walls are then restored to more near an ideal form with a light cured glass isomer or a composite restorative materials if in case a class 2 so you are supposed to build a wall so and you create a wall and then you can proceed with the cavity preparation so this is the preparation rules where the occlusal reduction for capping cusps will be 1.5 to 2 millimeter for all ceramic since all ceramic preparations usually needs to amount clearance because because the thickness of the ceramic should be 2 millimeter to avoid fracture okay Next is the amount of ax axial wall reduction for ceramic and composite restoration is 1 to 1.5, should be 1 to 1.5 and all, all margins should have 90 degree KO surface angle. Yes, it should be sharp 90 degree. Okay, it should, you cannot give a bevel for an indirect all ceramic or indirect cuticle restoration. Whereas when you do a cast metal restoration, let's say metal, you give a bevel because your metal has to flow through your bevel so that it adapts whereas your all ceramic crown there is no need to give a bevel okay so the cable surface margin should be 90 degree and then the line and line angle and point angle should be well rounded to avoid stress concentrations and then the carbide bar or diamond bar are used for tooth preparation okay this is like a normal preparation uh, protocols where you, you can use a carbide bar or a diamond bar anything and then the gingival occlusal divergence for inlay should be 2 to 5 degrees. This is a very important MCQ where they will ask your gingival occlusal divergence. Okay, this one is I was talking in the in the difference between your amalgam and your uh, class 2 inlay. Okay, for amalgam I said it should be occlusally convergence because it is mechanically retented your amalgam, whereas your inlay is occlusal divergence. So the occlusal divergence angle degrees should be 2 to 5 degrees this is this is a very important mcq next is any isthmus or any groove extension be at least 1.5 mm wide to decrease the possibility of fracture okay small undercuts if present should be blocked at this point i have already mentioned by either glass isomer or a composite or anything and then the pulpal floor should be smooth and flat yes and then following removal of extensive caries from any internal wall the wall is restored or more nearly ideal form with glass ionomer cement. I already explained this point. And uh, the proximal box should be the slide size at least 0 0.5 mm, but usually we advise to give a uh, little more than that since the bulk is more on the proximal surface. And uh, yeah, already I think these points I think I have already mentioned. And the finish line should be your shoulder preparation okay after okay let's say we have we have done with the preparation now we are moving on to the next step where is impression 
we take impression using addition silicon addition silicon is basically your putty material and before inlay onlay take impression for opposing model and by transition it means when you do a cavity preparation on the lower tooth you need to take your lower arch with additional silicon or putty material and the upper arch maybe with alginate it means you need to take both because when you're going to send the impression to the lab they're going to pour the cast and then they're going to check the occlusion as well is very important okay uh, some some students when I, I was posted in clinic they asked why we need to take the opposing arch okay we can we are going to do a restoration in the lower arch so why we need to take the impression of the upper arch so this is the reason because they're going to check the occlusion as well you cannot give a bulk ceramic restoration without checking the bite okay Okay, next the uh, properties of an impression material is like it should have a high strength it should have it should it should uh, grasp a good surface detail it should, it should be low deformation because the low deformation in the sense after you take impression it has to it cannot deform so much till it reaches your lab because once it reaches your lab if it changes then the whole point of taking impression is is, is, is a waste so the, the property should be it should have a low deformation and able to disinfect with without distortion yes okay next after that you can select the shade selection but as per the recent aesthetic uh, aesthetic protocols what they say is before you do the tooth preparation you have to check your uh, shade selection because uh, when after the tooth after you do the tooth preparation and since the pa patient has uh, opened his mouth for a long time there is a high chance for uh, dehydration of the tooth so the color color normal color of your the patient's uh, teeth can change so now they advise you to select the shade before you proceed or before you cut the cavity preparation or tooth preparation okay and next after that the next step will be uh, you have done the cavity prepare tooth preparation sorry and then you need to temporize the tooth preparation okay because since the temp because your your crown in the lab is going to take almost 10 to 14 days it depends on the lab timings okay so till then you cannot leave the cavity open so you're going to if in case an in layer only you're going to give a temporary temporary cement or in case if a veneer or a full ceramic crown or full crown preparation you're going to give a temporary crown so the advantage is, is the temporary crown protects the pulp dentin complex in vital teeth because otherwise the patient will develop sensitivity since you have, you have exposed the dentin. So next is maintain the position of the prepared tooth in the arch. Yes, sometimes if the crown is delayed, if if you, if you don't give a crown, what will happen? So there is a, there is a gap between your upper and the lower teeth, and the, there is a high possibility that there will be a supra eruption. Okay. So to avoid that you need to give the temporary crown and then it protects the soft tissue adjacent to the prepared areas yes the, it, pro it prevents from any food lodgement or something like that right so let's move on to that and then okay usually the advice okay this is the slide that is showing a temporary temporary this thing they have done an uh, inlay so they have temporized before before they fix the permanent crown so this is how it looks okay i think we have done with uh, inlay and onlay so now we move on to veneers so so this is an important topic and then this this is we, you're going to you're going to be doing in your private practice because once you finish the university or college so you're going to practice veneers a lot because since veneers is now it's it's going to be the main integral part of your research industry yes Okay, I want to share some of the slides which I attended uh, for in a, in an aesthetic workshop. Uh, I have gone to Mumbai and then I have learned under uh, aesthetic uh, person, aesthetic uh, teacher called his name is Maxim Belograd. But I want to just uh, share slides a, a bit. So this is the workflow how you do in your uh, aesthetic smile designing actually. Okay, what is smile designing? Digital smile designing. Digital, digital smile designing is a software where where you it will be installed in your in your laptop or system uh, in your computer. 
Okay. Once you have taken a digital impression, since I mentioned that there is a machine called as digital impression machine, where you just have to place it on the patient's mouth so that it's, it scans, and then you can upload that into your digital smile designing, or you can take a normal picture with your macro lens, with a normal SL uh, camera, digital camera, and then there are certain angulations which your software uh, will indicate that you need to take in such angulation. For example, the first picture shows only the central incisors and the lateral incisors. So you need to take in that angle and then you need to upload in the software. So after you upload in the software and then you, you the software will allow you to edit. For example, can you see the first picture? Can you see a yellow line on the uh, one one? So in that case, you can just, as for example, if it's, it's a midline diastema, you can use the software to just increase increase your dimensions, okay? And increase the dimensions and then correct it. And then it will, you can always add a composite on, uh, virtually on your cast, which was, sorry, not the cast, virtually on the system. So this acts as an education material where you can show the patient like, okay, after I do the final restoration, your restoration is going to look like this. Okay, are you happy with it or you want to do any corrections in that? So you can always get the patient's feedback also. Some patients will say, I, I don't want this much longer incisor. I, I want a little shorter. I want like this. So you can always take that into consideration. And then after you do that in your digital smile designing software, and then you move on to wax prototype. Okay. Wax prototype is nothing but you must have taken the impression before and then you have to let's say midland diastema what they will do they will close the space with the wax in the lab and then they give it in the cast so you, this you can always show to the patient like okay this is how it's going to be okay so after that it's called wax wax prototype and then it's called and then it's called mock-up or smile prototype the next step is smile what you have to do the second step they will give it with the wax they build up your midline diastema with your wax so what you have to do you just have to take impression on the cast okay and then in that impression you can use a temporary crown uh, that's called i think pro temp or some temporary this thing you can use it and then you can you can place that on the patient's tooth surface so what will happen the replica of the wax up will be on the patient's mouth and then you can just reduce it and then adjust and you can show so that acts as a patient education and then the patient is aware that okay my final restoration is going to look like this you can always tell the patient to use it for one week as well i have seen a lot of dentists uh, just give them a temporary mock-up and then ask them to use it for some time then if they are comfortable then they can proceed so this is the work since we are talking about veneers we also should talk about some evidence why what we are doing is so, it's always very important to we talk about evidence based dentistry okay you cannot do whatever you wish like in recent dentistry before they were doing but now whatever procedure you do you 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 should have a justification of what why you're doing and for what you're doing so there are certain literature evidences stating that when the teeth are normal in color okay and then the patient has a slight uh, discoloration. For example, I want my teeth to be little more brighter. So when it is a normal color, so at 0 0.3 mm reduction remains ideal for the porcelain. Okay, it means imagine 0 0.3 is very very thin. So they say it is it is ideal for a porcelain to perfectly blend it. But when the teeth are darker than A3, A3 shade, as we all know, it is little darker than your A2. But we usually the universal shade is A2 is the universal shade for everybody. Okay, it may change for somebody, but mostly universally it will be A2. So when the teeth are darker than A2, when it is A3, and the patient want the shade to be A1 or B1, you need to reduce more of your tooth structure. Can you imagine? But if it is a normal tooth, your reduction is less. If it is more darker, you need to do a more preparation. Why? Because you need to add more material in the ceramic to mask your discoloration. So that's the concept behind that. As a general guideline, an additional 0.2 mm of reduction is necessary for each additional shade change. Hope you understand. Your, mod, your normal tooth color, the cervically, it should be 0.3 mm. And uh, the middle third, it will be 0.5 mm reduction. Incisally, it is 0.7 mm.
Okay, this is for the normal tooth. And for the moderate discoloration, for example, let's say, what do you mean by moderate discoloration? Moderate discoloration, you can have a moderate fluorosis. Okay, so the reduction is still more. As I said, you need more material to mask the discoloration. So the cervical it should be 0 0.5 mm and middle third is 0 0.5, incisal third is 0 0.9. If it is a severe discoloration, like severe fluorosis or severe tetracycline stains, you can the difference between your fluorosis is fluorosis some white flecks or white patches seen on the tooth surface your your whereas your tetracycline stains is it's, it's a thick band of stain so the discoloration is severe in this case so you need to remove more of the tooth structure like 0 0.7 in the incisal middle third is 0 0.9 and incisal is 1.1 mm as your uh, crown, your normal crown preparation, also a uh, full crown preparation is only two angulation. Okay, for veneers, this is three angulation. So they have they have drawn it and show you the incisor and your middle third and the cervical. Okay, so this is the microscopic image. Okay, next we come to the preparation. How we do it? So there are there are there is actually a kit available for veneer preparation where. Uh, the full full burr set will be there. Okay, the first picture you can see three. The burr is different. I I don't know how many of you have must have seen this. So this is called as um, end cutting depth end cutting burrs. Okay, so so this is mainly for veneer preparation. Okay, the top portion, the tip of the burr, okay, is usually for cervical. The middle one is for the middle third. The cervical, the last one is for. Uh, incisal. Can you see the thickness? When you see the cervical part, the burr is thin. When when it when it goes down to the incisal, the burr is little thick. So it means how much ever you cut, okay. So the depth will be only it will cut the depth of 0 0.3, 0 0.5, and 0 0.7. Okay. Can you understand? If you don't understand, please uh, free feel to discuss in the discussion forum. Okay. Okay. Next, you after you do the depth cut. Okay. And then the second picture shows you need to define your you change the burr and define with a tapered fissure okay as i said there are three angulations incisal angulation your middle third angulation and your cervical angulation you need to follow that okay and then this slide shows a different types of tooth preparation okay for there are there are different types of uh, veneer preparations actually to be precise so the A picture shows uh, window preparation. Okay, window preparation is nothing but a preparation. You remove only the enamel. The, your finish line should be just above your incisal tip. Just above your incisal tip. Okay. And then the second picture is your feather like. Okay, feather like is you just have to just your preparation should end in the incisal tip. Okay, the C picture is the most common veneer preparation we use. It's called butt joint preparation where you just have to give a butt joint there. Your, your preparation is butt joint. It, it, it is flat. Okay, so the D picture is incisor overlap. Okay, what you do is your preparation your, or your, this, your uh, veneer should will overlap your incisor tip and then goes little bit in the palatal surface. So usually we don't advise D type. The most common type is C type because there are a lot of literature saying the retention is more in that is your um, butt joint preparation. Okay, this is and then why they advise a butt joint preparation is better is the first one is your what is that? The first one is your it may be a window preparation or a feather type preparation where your it, it has got unrestricted movement in the sense your the, the dislodgement of the veneers is more common in this type the first type the second type is called butt joint where the retention is more and then your 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 last preparation is your path of insertion is more here so so there is a high chance for to dislodge okay after you've done the preparation and uh, after you've taken the impression we have given the impression to the lab so the you have you have done temporization also and then the finals once the material from the lab arrives so your next type is looting 
So looting, what you have to do is you just have to remove the temporization which you have done already. You can make the patient sit comfortable and then you have to apply the rubber dam. Okay, apply the rubber dam and then you're going to uh, prepare the tool surface as well as your ceramic surface. Okay, all ceramic surface always needs two preparations like for the looting one is you have to prepare the tool surface in the sense preparation in the sense you're going to edge your, your acid edge your uh, tooth prepare tooth tooth surface and you, you're going to apply a dentin bonding agent on the tooth surface okay and whereas in your ceramic surface that when you see this the first slide the first picture on the top so you need to condition it's called conditioning the surfaces sorry it's not uh, preparation it's called conditioning the surfaces conditioning the tooth surfaces as well as conditioning the ceramic surfaces on the inside of the ceramic the first picture the top picture you need to use hydrofluoric acid okay hydrofluoric acid whereas your tooth surface you are using phosphoric acid which you use for a normal compost restoration okay the next step is after you after you uh, apply the hydrofluoric acid on the inner surface of your ceramic or the veneers so next step is you wash that uh, acid and then you apply silane coupling agent it's like it's like to be, uh, to, be to explain a layman term it acts like a glue for example it's it's a silane coupling agent helpful in bonding okay so silane coupling agent you need to apply on the ceramic surface and in the tooth surface you have applied bonding agent okay and then you are going to after that next step in your crown that is your inner surface of your veneers or all ceramic crown is you have to load your resin cement in the second picture it shows your resin cement okay the topmost picture is uh, this one the they have etched with hydrofluoric acid and the the, the first left first picture is etching the second picture is you load the crown with resin cement that is called as a dual cure cement and then you go into the last picture you're going to loot it you're just going to fix it and then they, are, they have used a floss to just remove the excess cement okay and then you're done with that and uh, after this i'm going to talk about a composite resin inlays and onlays just just a little fast is because it is not it's not very very common procedure we do but if you if there are there are some dentists they, they use this technique as well so this is nothing but you're going to do a cavity preparation on the tooth surface you're going to take an impression and you're going to you're going to pour the cast and in that cast you're going to place the composite material and then you're going to do a restoration you just have to carve it and then cure it and little by little carve it you're going to prepare a composite restoration outside okay so this is an indirect technique and then once you once you are you are done with your carving and everything curing and then you take you remove that from the master cast and then you fix it on the patient's mouth and then you're going to check the high points polish finishing and everything and then after that check the bite and the bite is okay then remove that from the patient's mouth the restoration and then you can use the resin cement as well to loot it just have to follow the resin cement just load the resin cement and then you can just fix on the patient's mouth and then cure it and then adjust your bite again remove the excess cement okay so this is uh, the exact this is the this is what i have explained you first you have to do the tooth preparation and fix it remove the excess cement and then finally polish so this is how they do it so they the first picture shows uh, amalgam this fractured amalgam you have uh, stain on the amalgam surface they removed it and then they fix the composite there is indirect technique and then they clear the proximal surface and then the fourth picture finally they looted it okay, okay all right thank you very much for the patient listening and if you have any doubts please free to discuss in the discussion forum okay if you want you can create and i'll be just i'll be creating a discussion forum soon after they upload this video so so see you soon then thank you